So this is going to be a tutorial. There are going to be some examples that I'm hoping people in the audience want to work through as well. And so it'd be really helpful if you have a laptop or something to actually download the code. Um, if you don't have a laptop, you can follow along what I'm doing on the screen, but it's going to be more interesting if you are actually able to drive a lot of this yourselves. So I'm going to give people about a minute to um, copy the bit.ly link and get set up. So just while we're waiting, how many people have at least written some JavaScript at some point? A show of hands. Cool. That's good. I was worried that everyone had seen Java and had never heard of JavaScript before. So this is encouraging. This is really good. Um, so the way this is going to work is it's about 40 minutes of me talking um, and people optionally downloading a copy of this. This is a website, by the way, um, which you can download and kind of run through while I'm talking. Um, and then the other half is hopefully going to be actually getting you guys writing some code. Um, so if you don't have a laptop, sit near someone who does. Um, but moving on. Um, the way this works is if you're looking at it on your screen, um, you can click the code examples to run them, and these, the kind of results of the code, you can pin to the top of the page if you want to move around a bit more. So um, a little bit about me. My name is Gareth Rogers. I work for a company called Fortworks. Um, I do a mixture of things, um, but kind of half of my time is spent doing front-end stuff, but kind of the more technical front-end. So I'm kind of where um, old-school code and front-end overlaps. Uh, that's where I am at the moment. And I'm going to talk a bit today about D3. And D3 is a JavaScript library for creating data visualizations. And uh, data visualizations is really just a way of taking um, data, so like server logs, giant Excel documents, any um, kind of information that's normally represented in a textual or number form, and turning it into images or things that are more interactive um, and easier for users to interpret. Um, so, <clears throat> pardon me, um, a little bit about the scope of what I'm going to cover today. Um, this is really just designed to get people playing with d3.js as quickly as possible and getting people, like, showing you some working practical examples. So I'm not going to spend a long time talking about how JavaScript works or how d3 works, like, in terms of how, what the library does. I'm just going to show you how to use it. And I'm going to talk a bit about SVGs, um, the core concept behind d3, which is binding data to the HTML document and also just quickly cover some useful functions and kind of run down what makes a useful data visualization. Um, yeah, this isn't like an introduction to JavaScript. I'm assuming people have got at least a tiny bit of knowledge about that. And I'm not really going, D3 is a functional declarative, um, or it's at least it's got this kind of functional declarative interface over the top of it. I'm not really going to talk around, talk about what makes a functional declarative language. I'm just going to skip over that. Um, because it's fairly obvious once you've seen the code a few times. So what is visualization? Um, so data viz is just a way of taking information that is difficult to read or hard to read and surfacing up the useful bits in a more accessible format. Um, a good example of a practical approach is um, server logs, for instance. You can have one guy whose job it is to read through server logs all day, but that's really boring and it takes a long time. Or you can um, have a visualization that like flashes red whenever you see a 500, or whenever you have something that takes longer than like 3,000 milliseconds to respond on the server. Um, and if you drive it from colors or shapes, it's just a lot easier to see what's going on. People are good at looking at that. People aren't traditionally good at looking at um, lots and lots of text. Um, what is D3? D3 is a JavaScript library designed for working with data. It was written by a guy called Mike Bostock, who I think works for the either the New York Times or another big American newspaper, and they do a lot of stuff with data. Um, it's also used by GitHub and um, the Guardian newspaper. They've started, um, really in the last couple of years, people have started to do more of a, of a kind of news offering involved that's driven by um, data or representations of data. Um, especially in the front end, that's, um, before I go forward, it's uh, worth pointing out that this all runs on the client's machine. It's a front end, um, front end library. There have been some attempts to get it working using uh, Rhino or Nashorn and also using uh, Node.js, and I think they've been successful. I've seen a couple of examples of that. 
but um, most of this, or at least this presentation, assumes we'll be running it on the client side. So let's just take a look at some D3 code. And if anyone has any questions as we go along, please stick your hand up um, rather than sitting there. So this is like an end-to-end -end example. I don't expect everyone to understand what's going on to start with, but hopefully by the end of this presentation, um, we'll have a much better idea of how it works. So if I run this, what we get is a, um, a actual visualization of the data. So just to talk through what's going on um, and diving straight in, I'm not really going to, uh, yeah, let's just dive straight in. So we have this variable here, boring server logs, and this is just an array of strings. You combine its JavaScript, so it's, it's not exactly typeless, but um, it's at least dynamically typed, so you can shove whatever you want into an array, and as long as something fits in an array, you can use D3 to visualize it somehow. So to start with, we have this bunch of strings, and we're grabbing hold of um, something called results box, and results box is just this div up here. Um, and we're selecting it using a regular CSS selector. So if you've ever seen any jQuery or done any work um, in any real front-end work before, you'll probably be familiar with how um, what we're doing. This just means ID, so we're grabbing the ID of this box. Um, and we just have a reference to it, which we're storing in results box. So off of results box, we're grabbing every div, or we're creating um, D3 works using the concept of selections. So we're creating a selection which grabs all divs with the logline class. And then we're binding in our data. So we're taking our data here, and we're just binding it to this selection. Then we're calling .enter, which um, I'll go over in a bit. And then we're just saying, for every piece of data, I want to add a div. I want to give it the logline class. And I want to set the text inside that div um, using this function. And all this function is doing is it is taking each piece of data and returning it as a string. Um, and the way D3 really works is by you have your array of data and you create an association with, with elements on the page. So each element on the page, each div that we've created, knows about the piece of data it's bound to. It doesn't know about the rest of the data, it just knows about, so in this case, it knows about the string it's associated with. So this element at the top knows that it belongs to this string here. Um, then we're just setting up some basic properties and we're using CSS styles to do this. D3 has a dot style um, accessor which lets you easily set the um, height, width, and background color, which are just CSS properties. And then finally what we're doing is we are adding a second div underneath the, um, underneath the text and we're setting the width of this to the um, response time from these server logs. So if I run that again, and we're using a transition to make it look a bit nicer. So all the transition is, is um, again, if you've used jQuery.slideout, um, it's just interpolating string values under the hood, um, and the string values are just CSS properties. So it's saying, to start with, width is going to be 0, then it's going to be 1, then it's going to be 2, until it reaches the um, width returned by this width from log time. And all that's doing is, again, taking one of these strings and turning it into a width. Uh, that's a fast end-to-end -end example. We're going to look more in-depth about how this works, so don't worry if it's not really clear what's going on. Um, kind of the main point of D3 is that you can control the value of elements using values or functions. So in some places, I'm just setting a... Um, so here, for instance, I'm just setting the height to 10, and so all of my elements will have a height of 10. But for these black boxes down here, um, we're using a function to determine the width, and so every element will have a different width based on the piece of data it's bound to. So um, D3 looks a lot like jQuery to start with. It uses uh, method chaining a lot, which is um, evil and nice in kind of equal measure. It's useful because you can write much shorter code. Um, it's kind of horrible because if you're not careful, you end up with a like, classic JavaScript train wreck of 50 method calls all chained um, after one another. Um, it has a bunch of kind of accessors, and the um, idiom it uses is that if you grab an accessor and just give it a, um, the name of what you want to access, it will return it. If you give it a second argument, um, it will also set that value. So um, div.style.backgroundColor will return the current background color. div.style.backgroundColor red will set that to red. Um, so 
as I kind of touched on before, the main difference between D3 and jQuery and kind of your other more traditional um, libraries that work with the DOM or work with HTML is that D3's concept of using a function to represent how you want something to look rather than just using a plain value. So the main um, thing or the main idea behind D3 is this idea of joins where you join your data to an element on the page. And this is the most difficult bit to understand, but once you have your head around it, the rest of the library is pretty easy to use. So just talking through what the code does, first of all, we, we're creating this list variable, and this list variable is just um, getting hold of a UL, which is an unordered list element. Um, and that's all it's doing. We just have a reference to this box down here, and we're sticking it in a var so we can grab hold of it later. Um, select all is a kind of, it's a special selection in D3. We're no longer selecting an element, we're creating the concept of a selection. And so what I'm saying is for every list element, I want to add this data, and I want to make the text inside that list element um, a string based on this data. Um, and string is really just a function. Well, it's a constructor, but a constructor is a function, and it will just take a number and spit out a string. So if I run this piece of code, we get three numbers. Uh, those are the first three pieces of data. You'll notice that we've actually got five pieces of data. We've got the numbers one to, uh, one to five, um, but we only see three of them on the page. And that's because we've um, selected list elements, but we only had three of them to begin with. So the first D3's default method of binding data is it will try to bind your data to what is already on the page. So, but if an element doesn't exist, you can still bind it to the page. You just have to tell D3 what to do if that element isn't already there. So the idea of a join is you're setting up an association. So you're saying for every piece of data, I want to join it to an element. Um, but you can say, if I try to add a piece of data to the page and it doesn't have an element, this is what I want you to do. And you do that by using this dot .enter chain. So you call dot .enter, then any methods you chain after that will be run for each piece of data that it can't find an element for. So in this case, we have the same example as above, but we're adding this dot .enter, add a, new list in, add a new list item, and set the text to the piece of data plus I'm new. So if we run this, we actually get four and five, which is what we were missing before, because we've created two new elements to contain four and five, and we've used the three elements that were already on the page. If we run this a second time, um, we actually lose the I'm new property, because it's only running these two lines of code. Because there are already five list elements, it doesn't need to run the entrance again, or at least it won't run the, in the entrance properties again because it's not making a new association, it's just using the ones that were already there. Um, and you can use this to also remove data. So if I just run this to set up um, five pieces of data, again, so we're taking one to five and we are adding a div for every new element we see because we're using enter, and then we're setting the text to um, the string representation of one of those numbers and we're giving it a font size of 32 to make it a bit nicer to see. Then the second function down here, we're grabbing exactly the same selection, so this exit example div and all of the divs inside it, but we're using select all, so it's the idea of a selection rather than a concrete thing on the page, and we're changing the data. So where previously we had five elements, we now have three elements. And so what that means is there will be two list items that no longer have a piece of data associated with them. And so in the same way we used enter to say, when you have a piece of data that doesn't have an element, do this, you can use exit, which is when you have an element which doesn't have a piece of data, I want you to run this. And so what we're saying here is, for everything that doesn't have a piece of data, I want to set up a transition, and a transition is just um, a helper in D3 to uh, interpolate values for you. Um, I want you to transition to having a font size of two, and then I want you to remove the element. So if we run this, we lose four and five, and we only have the pieces of data that have been left behind. So really, that is the key way of working with D3. You have these arrays of data, and you create an association with a selection. That selection doesn't have to exist yet, because you can create rules for what happens when elements don't exist in that selection, and when you have um, elements that do exist in that selection which don't have a piece of data. So I'm going to talk a bit about SVGs now, because D3 was really built for um, working with the SVG format. It will work with HTML, um, but SVGs are slightly nicer 
Um, it's a slightly more compact way of representing a graphic. It's an XML format, the same as HTML, and it's understood by modern browsers. Um, so Firefox, Chrome, IE9 and 10, um, it doesn't work on IE8 or any of those, but we try not to touch those browsers if we can get away with it, because they're kind of horrible. Um, so if I just run this, we're creating an SVG. Um, very, very similar to working with divs. You'll notice when we were working with HTML, we used dot .style to change the properties. When we work with SVG, we use dot .attr, which is short for attribute. Um, and SVG has a slightly different set of attributes to HTML, because uh, it's all about representing graphics. Instead of saying um, HTML is more about representing the structure of a page, SVG is purely about representing the structure of graphics. And so it's uh, sort of lower level. You'd no longer have to use CSS or the style property and use a DSL or domain specific language inside of that. You can access properties directly. So what this is doing is just for this array here, we're adding circles to an SVG. The SVG already existed inside this box. It was just empty. And we're grabbing hold of it in exactly the same way we were grabbing hold of the divs before and adding, um, adding the data, setting up CX, CY, R, and fill. And it's kind of obvious what these do. CX is where is the X position. CY is the Y position. R is the radius of each circle. And fill is just a color. Um, and then, just to make it slightly more interesting, we're moving the circles around by small random number, so it's not quite so static. Um, the full SVG format is pretty big. There's a really good reference for it on the um, Mozilla Developer Network, which I've linked to here. Um, for this, we're mainly going to be looking at three of the simplest elements, um, which are circle, rectangle, and path. Um, here's an example of each of them. Uh, one of the confusing things about D3 is there's no one way of representing things. Each um, kind of each element has different attributes based on what that element is. So for a rectangle, we have x, y, width, and height, which um, and x and y represent the top left-hand corner of your rectangle. So that would be down here. Um, SVG number space starts with zero zero up here and then goes down. Um, width and height fairly obvious. With the circle, we have CX and CY, and that means the center X and center Y coordinates. So when you draw a circle, you're actually saying where you want the center of the circle to be, rather than the top left-hand corner. R is the radius, um, so just how wide you want the circle to be from center to the edge. And paths have this um, strange kind of string inside of them in this D attribute, which describes how you want the path to look on the page. Um, but we're going to look, D3 provides very nice wrappers on top of this, so you don't have to write um, the, these kind of strings yourself. You can get D3 to do a lot of this for you, which is one of the reasons for using it. So let's look at actually using D3 to create a simple, um, simple bar chart. So I have some data down here. Um, it's just some books which I scraped off of Wikipedia. Um, the data is not very accurate. It's about as near as I could find it at one o'clock in the morning. Um, we have number of pages in each book, the title of the book, and um, when the book was published. We only have four pieces of data because we're trying to keep this example short and understandable. Um, D3 can quite easily cope with about a thousand pieces of data, maybe slightly more. So um, DataViz is kind of all about answering questions about your data. So if we have this and we want to represent to people which is the longest book, well, it's kind of obvious because it's just it's the one with the most number of pages. But if we had 500 books or 1,000 books, that would be less obvious. And we don't really want to force users to read giant JSON files. It's just um, not a great user experience. So we can represent this um, in a much nicer way by using a chart or a bar, very simple bar chart to begin with. So what we're going to do is add uh, rectangle elements to an SVG to represent how long each book is. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we grab our data. And this bar chart data function is just returning this JSON object up here. Then we select um, this div here. And we select all rectangles. Now, there currently aren't any rectangles inside of that SVG. But um, this is where the join comes in. We're creating the concept of a rectangle selection, not the rectangles themselves. So we're saying, for every rectangle, even if they don't exist yet, I want to add this data. And if those rectangles don't exist, I want you to run this entrance property. So we're adding a new rectangle. We're setting the x position to 0. 
um, and the y position to uh, the y position based on the index of the data. So our data is an array, and the index is just the location of that piece of data in the array. So the first item we add will be at the top. The second one will be slightly further down at um, y equals 30. The next one y equals 60. The next one y equals 90. Um, we're then going to set the width of each rectangle based on the number of pages. So this is where, going back to the idea that each element you add knows which piece of data it was bound to. So for each of these rectangles, this function gets evaluated, and it passes in the book, which is a piece of data, and gets the number of pages and divides it by three. And so for each element, it's going to use that for the width. The height is just set to 18, and the fill is kind of set to this blue-green color. Um, so cool, we've got some bars that represent the length of pages, but no one knows what they mean. They're just a bunch of bars on a page. So with data visualization, you, kind of, you have to be careful because you're looking at the code so much that you surface up to your user what the, um, what the intention is. So let's, first of all, add some labels. Um, to add the labels, we're using the XV, SVG text property. Um, again, we're creating a selection. The only difference is this selection um, also has a class on it. And the reason we give it a class is because we want our selections to be unique. So because I'm going to be adding more text properties later on, I want to be able to tell the difference between labels which are the titles of books and labels which I use for other things. Um, we're just setting the X and Y position so that the, um, each title is at the end of a bar. And we're setting the text equal to the title of the book. So again, we have this function. It takes each piece of data and it returns the, um, the title of the book. And finally, we kind of want to communicate to our user that the, um, but our unit of measurement here is pages, and that this is a visualization of pages against the name of a book. So we're just going to add in this final function. And after looking at the other two, it should be pretty clear what this guy is doing. Um, the only thing that's slightly different about this is we're using a class to, sorry, a CSS class to control the properties of um, some of this stuff. So rather than writing, rather than setting the font family, um, or the size or the color in D3, I've set it in the CSS of this document, and that's a nice separation of concerns. If you have any element in your SVG that you want to be static, you can style it in exactly the same way you'd style a um, HTML element. Cool. So that was like a very simple example, but the real value of data visualization is being able to show how one aspect of your data changes with regards to another aspect. So we can look at a slightly more complicated question, which is how does the publication date of each book affect the number of pages that were in the book? And this is where you can really start to visualize things that you can't see just by, just by reading through the file, or at least you can't see very easily. So before we talk about that, I'm going to talk about D3 scale functions, because um, they'll help us to answer this question. A scale function um, simply takes in a number and gives out another number. Uh, but you can use them for things like positions. If your data values range from 0 to, um, I don't know, 30. So say you're looking at the average temperature, um, and it never really gets above 30 degrees C. Um, but your SVG is kind of 3,000 pixels long, or 3,000 points long. You can use a scale to map 0 to 30 to 0 to 3,000. And that's what we're doing here with um, 0 to 5 and 0 to 50. So we d3.scale.linear is just creating a scale object or a scale function. Most, most objects in D3 are functions. It's uh, kind of directly functional. We're setting the range property of this scale to be between 0 and 50. So range is information I want to come out of my scale. And we're setting domain to 0 and 5. Domain is information I'm putting into my scale. So if we run this, and all this is doing is adding um, five divs. Or is that five? Yeah, five divs for. Um, each of these numbers, and then running these numbers through the scale function. So again, because we can use a function just as easily as we can use a value, and D3 is smart enough, if it sees a function assigned as a property, it will run that function for that piece of data and evaluate it. So here we can see that um, 0 gets mapped to 0, 1 is mapped to 10, 2 is mapped to 20, 3 is mapped to almost 30, but JavaScript's maths is terrible. Do not trust JavaScript when it comes to maths, but this is the best it can do. Um, and this kind of doesn't matter if you're actually using it to position something, but um, don't use it for like calculating complex financial transactions. It's just going to bite you. Um, 
Yeah, so we can make scales more interesting though. Um, scales using numbers, we can kind of do that ourselves. We could times everything by like 0.1 and add three or whatever. Um, sort of linear maths isn't too complicated. But when you look at maths involving um, colors, for instance, that's not, we don't want to work out hex values ourselves. That's just a pain. We can get D3 to do it for us. So rather than setting the range, which is the output values of our scales to, um, rather than setting it to numbers, we can set it to color values. And again, D3 is smart enough to just return a function that will spit out colors. So if I run this piece of code, we actually get this nice gradient effect. Um, and again, for 0.0, it's mapping it directly to this color here, which is kind of the pink one. And for 1.0, it's mapping it to this color. For the rest of the values, it's actually working out what a combination of those two colors would, um, should be and just returning it for me. Um, so again, you can use color in your visualizations to represent something. If you were representing heat, you could map zero degrees to blue and like 50 degrees to red, and everything else would be a color somewhere in between. So, but what we wanted to do is look at our data based on the date values, and D3 scales also support dates. So rather than having to turn your date into like a Unix time and kind of divide that by a couple of thousand to position it, you can just say, hey, I've got these dates between my max date and min date, and I want to uh, spit them out between zero and 100 pixels, go away and do it for me, and D3 will happily do that. So if we want to look, um, see how the publication date affects the number of pages, uh, let's create a visualization to do that. The first thing we're going to do is just add a circle for um, every, every book. Um, there. They're all on top of each other. It's kind of boring. Um, I'm not going to talk through this because it's kind of exactly the same as we were doing before. Um, but let's make it a bit more interesting. Let's add a scale um, that uses the dates and positions each of these guys based on its date. And to set up the scales, there's a, there are a couple of helpers you can use that come with D3. So it has a max and a min function, which are designed to work over arrays. Um, each ma max and min both take your array of data and then an accessor and it will return the maximum or minimum value from that accessor. So we're using these to find our, the kind of latest book and the earliest book, and then we're using a time scale, and we're setting the domain to the earliest and latest book. We're setting the range, so the output value of this, to be 50, which will be slightly to the left of the um, box at the top, or slightly inside to the left, and 550, which will be slightly to the right. So this is about 600 pixels wide. SVGs don't work in pixels because they're scalable, but it currently has a kind of one-to-one -one ratio between um, pixels and width. So if we run this, stuff spreads out according to the date uh, which it was published. And the way this is happening is we're just grabbing hold of all of the circles again. We don't have to enter them because we entered them in the previous example. So we're just setting up this transition um, to move the CX, which is the center X of each of the circles, um, according to the X scale value for its published date. And also um, at the bottom, I'm just sticking, um, I'm just pulling this X scale function up into a higher scope because I want to access it for an example later on. Um, and we can do exactly the same stuff for the Y scale. We can take, um, this time we're just using the number of pages, which is just a number, so we'll just use a linear scale. If we run this guy, we can space stuff out in the Y direction as well. So similarly, um, we're using max and min, but this time to get the number of pages, we're constructing this linear scale, um, and we are setting up the domain of that scale based on max and min pages, and the input and output values are the top and bottom of this SVG. And then we're using this scale down here to position the CY property, or to set the CY property, rather. And again, I'm just yanking the scope of the Y scale so I can grab hold of it. So. That may have seemed like a slightly labored example in that you could have probably written those scales quite easily yourselves in less code. But another reason to use the scale functions is D3 will automatically turn scales into axes for you. So after you've positioned everything, you can just use these axis helpers to turn your scale into a um, nicely spaced axis and you don't have to worry about manually writing the SVG code to draw a line, position a tick, position a date, move it 10 pixels, position another date, move it 10 pixels, position another date. And then you know, your pet designer comes and tells you he wants to move everything by three pixels and you have to start again, which is a pain. So uh, again, D3 will do most of this for you. Um, the way scales, or way axes work rather, is um, 
kind of in exactly the same way everything else works in SVG, um, or at least in D3. It's a function that gets returned by calling d3.svg.axis. We stick it in a variable to get a reference to it, and then we set some properties on it. We set the scale to be, so I'm pulling back the x scale as um, stored earlier. We set the orientation, which is just um, telling D3 how we want it to generate this. And we set the tick values. So tick values are the spacing or number of points we want on each axis. Um, this dot append g, what it's doing is SVG has a concept of groups, and a group is like a layer. So you can shove a bunch of um, a bunch of shapes inside a group, and then move the group, and it will move the rest of the shapes for you. So um, think of kind of layers in Photoshop, uh, and that's what you're doing. You're just using code to create them. So we're adding a group for the x-axis, and we're using the translate property to move where it is on the page, and we're doing exactly the same thing for the y-axis. Hey. Uh, um, yeah, so the G is getting, I'll just pull the example back. The G is getting added to the SVG. So um, it's just another element inside your SVG. So if you were writing HTML, you'd have um, an unordered list element and you'd fill it with list indexes. Um, G is kind of the same concept, but you can fill it with shapes and then just move the group around. So it's just a container for all of your shapes, but if you wanted to separate them and move them independently of each other, you'd use a group element. The G contains uh, all the elements? Yes, exactly. So the G contains all of the elements of our scales and the translate. Sorry, I should have repeated the question. I see you moving up with the microphone. Um, the question was, how is this G element defined? Um, so I was just explaining that the G element is just another SVG element, kind of analogous to um, like a UL with LI elements inside. The properties, um, the SVG kind of specification says that any property you add to a G element gets propagated down to the shapes inside it. So we can define this translation once and it will be applied to every element inside. So the final thing, or two more things I'm gonna talk about and then um, we can hopefully get into some coding. Uh, paths and lines. So if you remember the earlier example, we had this path which was set with this D attribute and it had this kind of weird string inside. Um, D3 provides helpers for generating those strings for you. So the strings are actually a, um, a DSL or domain specific language for defining how a path should be rendered on an SVG. Um, D3, the D3 helpers for doing this kind of expect each path to be defined by its own um, array of elements or its own array of values. Uh, so let's go through, through this example here. So we have our data this time is an array of arrays. We have an array for every single line and we only want to create one line so we have one array inside our array. We grab hold of the div again and we're creating two functions, an x position and a y position function. And these functions get used in this um, line to create this line function down here. So d3.svg.line is just creating, or it's returning kind of a template line function from SVG's, uh, from d3's core library. We're setting, then we just call um, methods on it to set the properties. So interpolate linear, we're just setting the, um, the interpolator of this line to use the linear property. What the interpolator does is, um, or what the line does basically, is it has a series of points and it joins them up for you. The interpolation is just how it's going to join up a point. Linear interpolation just means it's going to draw a straight line between them. And the x and y properties are two functions. Um, and so what we're saying is for each piece of this data, the x and y position is defined by these two functions. So the, um, the y position is returned by timesing the index by 60. And the, sorry, the x position is returned by timesing the index by 60. So um, each, each element will spread out along the SVG. And um, the y position is 100 minus um, d to the power of 2. Or it doesn't really matter what these are, just that they define the points that are used. Um, how do we add this path to the SVG? Well, we create a group element. Um, we're giving it a class just so we can grab hold of it again later. We're appending this path, and then we're setting the attribute of the path to be the line function we just created. So for each piece of data, um, D3 will evaluate the line function for using D in each of these X and Y values, and we get this nice curved line. And then I'm just gonna store the X and Y functions in the scope again so I can grab hold of them. So 
as I, this kind of idea of interpolation. Paths are just a series of points that the SVG will um, kind of join up for you, and we can look at what those points are. And in order to visualize those points, we're just using the x and y function again, but we're using them to add circles instead. So we're taking um, this array up here, and this xpos and ypos function. We're able to get hold of this array just by inspecting the SVG. So this is the property where every element knows the piece of data it's bound to. So we can retrieve our data array just by inspecting the SVG and calling data on it with no arguments. And because it was an array of arrays, we're just getting hold of the first one, which is the, um, this 0, 1, 2, up to 9. Cool. And then, so we're using the same chart, and we're just creating the circle selection and entering a new circle. And we're using the um, x position function to position the x value. Um, we're just setting up c, y, and r. We're setting the fill, the stroke to black. And then finally, we're just moving them into place. But the, the key point here is we're using the same function to define the line as we are to define the position of the circles. So these circles are now sitting on the points that um, the SVG is joining up. So what does this line actually look like um, in terms of the, the D attribute or the SVG? It looks like this. Um, and the way we're, we're adding these labels is just by inspecting the D property here of the path. So the D property of the path is this string that defines where the points sit and how they should be joined up. Um, we're using this horrible regular expression to break it up into an array and then we're just adding um, labels or adding text elements to the SVG for each, um, each label in this array. So we can see that the start of a line is defined by this M0100. So M is just the start of a line. Um, lines actually contain subgroups of lines, so M means new subgroup. L um, means line two. So we're saying starting from 0, 100, draw a line to 1699, then draw another line to 12096, then another line to 11891. And these values are the values that are determined by the um, xpos and ypos functions we had before. Um, the final thing I'm going to talk about is how to use D3 to set up events. In this, and it's very similar to how you'd use jQuery to set up an on-click event. And the value of events is you can make your data interactive. So as well as displaying it visually, you can make things happen when you hover or when your user clicks on something, you can return more information or move your, move your entire visualization around. Um, events, you just bind using the on function, and in the same way as attributes and styles before, they have access to the piece of data that is associated with that element. So first of all, let's just create, um, create a logo for JDD. Um, two functions which uh, position the X and Y values, um, this data, which is just bunch of strings and a um, selection into the chart. We're then adding these red rectangles in the background and we're using um, the X and Y position to uh, decide where the rectangles should be. Um, we're moving the, the Y value slightly. And then um, we're adding these letters and the letters are just the data values. Um, so if we want to, at the moment this doesn't do anything, but we can make it more interesting. We can select every text element, and we can use the dot on method. Um, dot on takes the name of an event you want to bind to, and then a function. And this function has access to the data and the index. Um, inside the function, um, this points back to the element itself. So it's kind of it's setting up the scope for you. So um, depending on how much JavaScript you, you know, you might be expecting the this keyword to point back to the function itself. But in this case, D3 has set it up so that this points back to the element rather than the function. So it makes it very easy to get hold of the element. And then um, we're just saying, when I mouse over, I want to create this transition um, with a stroke width of 10 going down to a stroke width of 0. So now when I mouse over these guys, you actually see stuff happening. Cool, so that was like a very quick introduction to probably the four or five main things you want to use D3 for, and hopefully it's given you an idea of how you could start to set up your own kind of visualizations. The best way to learn D3 or anything, any kind of visual coding is actually to hack around with it. 
So um, part two of this tutorial is kind of um, designed, if you have a laptop, I have a, um, a load of starter code to get people started um, visualizing data, which I scraped from the um, XKCD, the webcomic has an API. I took a scrape of the API and I um, set up some kind of boilerplate D3 code for people to play around with. So um, there's a couple of tasks you can try and complete if you'd prefer a more directed exercise. So if anyone wants to stick around after the talk and code for the remainder, um, that's kind of what we'll be doing and I'll just be wandering around helping people. Um, as I suspect not everyone has a laptop, um, let's do Q&A now and then if anyone wants to um, hang around and learn some D3 and actually do some practical coding afterwards, we'll do that then. So uh, any questions? What's the purpose of the p domain? Sorry. What's you the purpose of the domain? The domain? The domain, yes. Um, it was this in the scale functions. Yes. Okay, so if we go up to where we're defining one of the scales. So the, the purpose of the domain is you're telling um, D3 or you're setting up the values that you expect to take into your scale. So your scale transforms numbers, it takes um, one and scales it up to, to 100, it takes two and scales it up to 200, for instance. So your domain is the idea of the number space or the input values which your scale accepts. And your range is the um, idea of the output values which you want to transform those input values into. Is that any clearer? No. Getting there? So um, it's ma it makes much more sense if you don't have a linear scale. If um, you had an exponential scale, for instance, um, you could set your domain to be 0 and 1, um, and then your range, you can base your range off of it exponentially. So think of it more as you're creating an association between your um, range and your domain. So you're saying you want your minimum range value to be 0, but you want your minimum domain value to be 50. So then if I put 50 into my scale, um, I'll get zero out. So it's a way of mapping your, mapping your data to um, some property that you want to use in your SVG, is the best way I can describe it. Uh, sorry, the back there, ah, behind the pillar. Uh, so we've said it's quite similar to jQuery or to CISL. Uh, mm -hmm. So what are the reasons to, to use D3 instead of them? So the main reason is D3 um, has this uh, idea of functions to represent attributes, whereas jQuery, jQuery really doesn't, or if it does, you have to kind of write stuff yourself. So the two advantages of D3 are um, it has this data binding, so it automatically creates the association between a piece of data and an HTML or, or SVG element, and it will automatically interpret functions for you. So you can just provide one function that decides the width of every single element you add to your SVG. And you could write very similar code in jQuery, it's just slightly more succinct in D3. Um, and also D3 provides you with the scale and axis helpers. And there's, there's a lot more to the library, this was just kind of an introduction. Um, but especially if you want to get into more mathematical visualizations, um, D3 has a lot of helpers to set up um, like linear and power-based scales for you. Um, and there are also a lot of templates people have written uh, that you can use. Cool. Do we have any more questions? Cool. Um, so if anyone wants to stick around in code, I'm going to be here for at least, um, or until the end of the session. Um, I will not take offense if people want to leave and get a coffee or do something else though. So let's take five minutes and then if you want to code, I'll be here in five minutes. And thank you very much for your lecture.
inside the example code, we have this um, workshop directory. And inside the workshop directory, we have um, some HTML, which actually, if I quit that guy, quit, quit that guy, uh, let's open this. We have some HTML, um, which is very, very simple. It's really just um, a div, and with a title inside that div, we have um, an SVG, and we've just set the height and width of that. And underneath, we've just got some uh, like simple explanations of the data. There we go. Um, and that's currently creating um, something that looks like this. Each of these squares is actually a comic from the... Um, so we have some data, and the data looks... like this. Um, it is just a, a giant JSON array. Um, and it's kind of, you can't read that. This is where, um, where DataViz comes into its own. We've got a couple of thousand entries in this JSON array. It's not formatted particularly nicely. And um, actually being able to see, see this and understand it is incredibly difficult. So uh, by turning it into an image or by creating some visual representation of it, we make it a lot more accessible. So if we just evaluate that in the, um, in the web console, we see that we have an array that's got about um, 1,200 pieces of data in. And each piece of data looks like this. Um, so we have the, is everyone familiar with XKCD? I kind of assumed being a developer conference that everyone would have read it. But, um, cool, I'll take that as a yes. Um, so each comic has um, URL to the comic, um, the day, month, and um, somewhere the year it was published, a uh, transcript of the text and the title, um, and a few other pieces of data. So we can start to visualize these and to, um, in kind of the boilerplate code. All we're doing is um, setting up a bunch of uh, variables. This is something I didn't do in the examples to save space, but it's, uh, it's really a good idea, is rather than just using magic numbers everywhere, pull out a few constants um, to explain what's going on. So we're getting a selection, or we're selecting our SVG, and then we're adding all of these rectangles to it. So for every single comic in this array of comics, we're adding a rectangle element, and we're, um, we have a couple of functions which are positioning the x and y value in this grid here. And we're setting the fill currently to a uniform value, which uh, it's kind of boring. Like this whole thing is just a bunch of gray squares at the moment. Um, it would be good if we could somehow change it based on some property of the comic. So. Let's change this fill from a, um, a regular value to a function. And let's, in our function, first of all, return red or something. So this should just, it's pretty much the same as um, just setting red, except the only difference is we're now using a function rather than a plain value. But if we wanted to make this slightly more interesting, um, we can start to use one of D3's scales. So we can say d3.scale.linear. Um, so the range, which is the output, let's set to somewhere between, um, I don't know, let's go with that guy. And weird thing about these is they actually take arrays with um, two properties in rather than um, anything else. Oh, they actually can, they can take more than two properties. Um, set those two values there. And then let's set our domain to be 
zero, and I'm going to cheat, and rather than evaluating this, I'm just going to work out that there are 100, 1, 2, 6, 8 comics. So 1, 2, 6, 8. I'll create the scale, and then this guy takes the um, data, so D is the comic here, and I is the index, and off of the back of this, I'll just pass in the index, and um, we'll see what we get out. Cool. So those are changing very slightly, but uh, there are too few of them to be able to see. So what if we change the grid size? Or Cool, so the way I originally planned for this to work is um, to answer, to get people to work in pairs or in small groups to answer the, the problems down here. Um, because we don't actually have that many people, um, I'm not sure if of a value in doing that. I can just work through the examples myself and people are willing to watch, or you can. Yes. Cool, so I can work through the examples myself, or I can kind of, if anyone has any questions about what the actual code looks like, or how you would do a certain thing, or wants to see something done in a certain way, kind of just ask, and we'll, um, we'll do it that way, rather than sticking to kind of a strict classroom style session. Cool, so if we look at the, the questions we might want to ask, well, we already have an element for every comic on the page, and we've started to give each element its own appearance, but it's not a kind of not done particularly well. I've just hacked it in, so let's neaten this up a bit. The first thing I'm going to do is actually pull out the scale to be a um, let's call it color scale, and let's store it in a variable. Zero. And rather than um, cheating, we might want to change the number of comics later. So let's actually uh, use one of D3's helpers to work out the number of comics. So where are we binding our data? What did we call? Our data is called comics. So max comics. And ah, it's just comics.length at this point. And again, um, so at the moment, we're setting this based on the, the index of every, uh, every comic, but that's not particularly interesting. It doesn't really tell, tell people anything. So instead, let's set it based on, I don't know, the length of the transcript. So if we work out our maximum transcript, um, by providing an accessor which is going to run through every comic and return um, c dot transcript dot length, hopefully. Then in our domain, we can go from zero to, and it's no longer really max comics. Um, it's max transcript. And then for our fill down here, we can just provide um, viz dot color scale. And for every comic, it will work out the color for us based on the length of the transcript. Or it'll break, and it broke. Dangers of live coding. Unexpected workshop line 22. 
Yes, because um, that's just nonsense. Max transcript length is not defined. Yes, that's because I called it this dot max transcript length. Cool. These are all black. Why are these all black? That's a color, that's a color. So one thing we can do is actually find out. <coughs> ah, no worries. Um, so if this is 15, does it actually give us a color? It does, um, but that color is red, I think. So if this is 100, Ah, so it is actually changing. I'm guessing that ah, if transcript length is actually null, then we're not going to get anything, and I'm guessing that's what's going on. C return C dot max comics function C return I'll say let's um so first let's just check to see if that works. Cool. Okay, so the reason these are all so dark is because trans max transcript length is a lot bigger than I thought it was. So it's pushing everything to the end of our scale. So the way to solve that problem is actually to, uh, for me to stop being lazy and work out the minimum transcript length instead of using zero. Transcript length, max transcript length, and rescale dot linear. Aha, and our color is not a number, not a number, not a number, which is a definitely not a color. So if anyone can see why this isn't working, um, feel free to shout out and tell me why I'm wrong instead of just watching me suffer. So with the colors, it should, I will change them. Um, but I think the way it does color interpolation is, um, shouldn't be affected by that. But That's definitely a number. Min transcript length is zero, okay. So there is actually one with zero. And if we use our color scale and actually just stick a number into it, we get a value. If we stick zero into it, we get a value. If we stick a stupidly big number into it, we totally get a value. But when we use it down here, ah, of course, 
So this was because I was passing the whole comic into the scale rather than just the um, transcript length, which is what I wanted to use to determine the color. So if we fix that, so we're actually passing in comic dot transcript dot length, and we're returning it. Hey. So now we have something that is actually changing based on the, um, based on the length of the transcript. So we can see that this guy here, um, there's something interesting about it, but we don't know what. So uh, let's change this so we can actually inspect um, each element and see what's going on. And we can do this by grabbing hold of the SVG. Again, we're selecting all of the rectangles, and because our only rectangles are comic representations, um, we don't need to give them a class. If this was an actual kind of working piece of code, I'd probably want to give every element a class, so I could select it. I'm just going to say on click to start with function C I. So that's comic and index. And let's just do a simple console.log comic.transcript. Excellent. So we can see that this guy has a ridiculously long transcript. Um, and this guy, quite long, not as long. This guy. Cool. So we can start to make things interactive and um, call out kind of what it is that makes something interesting. So going back to the um, list of problems I was going to try and solve in this exercise, where have we got to? Cool. So give each element its own appearance based on the data. We've kind of done that using a color scale. Um, Use a scale function to order the elements by publication date. Cool, let's give that one a go. I think it's d3.time.scale, but I'm going to uh, cheat and look at my own examples. Yeah, dot time dot scale. And let's also define a helper function here, which um, we'll do comic to date. So this guy takes in a comic and is going to return a new JavaScript date. And kind of knew I'd need this bit. So looking down here, um, I already had this code. Um, date will take a year, month, and a day. Um, but we'll need to pass those out as integers. So in comic to date, um, let's return a new date based on pass int. Comic dot year, pass int. Month and pass it comic dot day and new dates. I'm just going to check that works before we go too much further. <laughs> 
zero into this guy. Comics with an S zero. Um, Feb 1st, 2006, which um, I believe is correct. Yep, 2006, month one. Oh, that's interesting. I was expecting that to be January the 1st, 2006. Very, yes, very probably. Let's give that a try. Yep, that looks about right. Thank you. Cool, and so with our scale, we can, I did not want to do that. Um, with our time scale, we can start to um, build up how we want this to work. So range, which is what we spit out. Um, we already have the function which works out the x position, which is just using the index as its main argument. In fact, its only argument here is the index. And so if we change it so the comics are no longer ordered by index, but instead are ordered by this function here, um, by this scale function, we should be able to change their position based on, the, um, based on time. So if I want my range to be 0 to d3 dot max comics, and no, I just want comics to length. Right. Ah, uh, I do. Thank you. And for the domain, we need to do this dot first comic equals d3 dot min comics comic to date oops just realized I haven't closed off that guy So So we're just again using the max and min functions to find the um, sort of min and max of our data set, which is something you end up doing um, quite a lot. Ah, uh, comic date. Yes, of course, because it is. Stored on the viz object. Um, the reason I'm sticking everything off of the back of the uh, viz object is because it is an easy way of trying to namespace your stuff in JavaScript. Um, a problem you often run into in a in kind of a big JavaScript code base is all of the good names get taken and um, you end up overwriting everyone else's code, which is horrible. So um, kind of a good pattern to get into is appending everything off of the end of some kind of parent object. So at least you can try and avoid naming conflicts. So we now have our time scale, and hopefully this works. Time scale, and so if we stick in comics zero, ah, not a number, that's not very nice. First, so let's see if um, first comic, yep, yep. 
this is returning not a number time scale set our range to zero Once again, yes, exactly the same mistake as before. Thank you. Um, did everyone hear that? that was basically, it's not working because um, I'm passing in the whole comic rather than um, passing in uh, is dot comic to date uh, comics zero. Cool. So uh, our first comic, we get zero. Um, for our sixth comic, we get something that isn't zero actually get quite a high number um, for our thousandth comic. Cool. So this is showing that our comics aren't actually in order at the moment, um, but this time scale should actually order them for us. So now to start with, let's um, take out our existing positions and update them to use our new scale function. So to start with, I'm just going to set y to uh, 50. Why? Uh, yeah, let's just set y to 50. So um, everything will be at the same level vertically. Um, but I'm going to set x to function comic return is dot time scale comic to date comic cool um, and the final thing I'm going to do is times that by is somewhere we have grid size. So things should be spaced out slightly more evenly. And as we can see, the comics aren't um, published at even dates. So where they're grouped together, you sometimes get um, three days and have a comic every day, and then there's a gap. Um, but interestingly, it's quite seasonal, so you can see See the breaks in time there. So if we wanted to make this more complicated, we'd probably um, change the x and y grid functions um, based on that index instead of the exist or based on the index out of a scale instead of the existing index, and it would position them um, nicely based on width and time. But because of time constraints, I'm just going to move on to I think the last um, last. Bit. Oh, okay. That was pretty much the last bit. So, yeah, rather than torturing everyone with making me try and do that, um, I think I'm going to call it here. Thank you very much for paying attention. Um, I'm sorry the last bit wasn't as collaborative as I'd hoped. Um, it's kind of a, it's always a danger when you ask everyone to bring a laptop and join in. But thank you, those of you who did join in, and I hope you found it very useful. Um, feel free to catch me in the break if you want to ask any questions. Um, and the whole thing is on GitHub if you want to clone it, steal it, do whatever. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for your practical part also. And so we have a long break, um, dinner break, uh, which is um, downstairs. As you know, there's the small part of uh, Buffet and also uh, here the, the, bigger, uh, the biggest